What's up everybody? It's your good friend Lukey and this is my new YouTube channel. Please subscribe to help me. Look on the screen. Don't be a reoccurring viewer. Only 25% of the people watching these videos are subscribing. Hit the bell icon. Subscribe now, please. What's up? It's your good friend Lukey and I'm back. I'm playing around with the lighting setup. I know it probably looks atrocious. You typically fail before you get good at things. Let me know in the comments section if this looks better or you want me to go back to previous setups. I'm just trying to step my game up. Also, before we go into t this week's fight preview, as I always do, visit my Substack. I'm doing really good work there. It's my unique way to be myself. You can simply access it by going to the YouTube portal for my channel and then clicking on the Substack. It's completely free, but if you want to support me, there's a membership tier and it just goes directly to me and I'm grateful. So if you think I work hard and you like what I do, that would be a major blessing, but no pressure either way. Just wanted you to know. Let's get into this week's fights. July 15th, one day after my surgery. Yeah, I'm not going to get into that, but I am a little anxious and nervous, so, you know, wish me the best. I, I'd really like that in the comments. Frank Martin, an emerging American lightweight superstar who's a part of one of the biggest teams in boxing. Derek James is a marquee trainer, a marquee coach. He has great fighters in every glamour division. Anthony Joshua is now training with him in heavyweight. Errol Spence Jr. has been with him his whole career, and he might end this year as the number one pound-for-pound -pound fighter, quite possibly. And lightweight is a big division with Shakur Stevenson, Devin Haney, Gervonta Davis, all these great fighters, and Frank Martin is in that division. And, needless to say, the undisputed 154-pound champion, Jermel Charlo, who is going to fight Canelo Alvarez at the end of September, and I think he has a better chance than people are giving him a credit for. So Derek James, needless to say, is one of these coaches that a lot of people are drawn to. I think also the fact that he's such a mild-mannered person, he's very cerebral, very nice guy, it seems, or at least he gives off the impression of being a very nice guy and also the fact that he trains regular people and has outlined a path where he's not going to be in the boxing game forever this group of guys is his group of guys and then he's done with boxing is what he recently said in a story where i just read the headline so that could have been clickbait also forgetting Derek james also has ryan garcia in his camp now garcia has moved to texas but frank martin reminds me of williams of Peta, though they fight completely different they're lightweight contenders that are just beneath the surface. They're high-risk, low-reward guys who are going to get their opportunities strictly based upon the world title organizations, a sanctioning body, allowing them to compete for a belt. So they're probably going to have to wait it out. This fight, he's fighting a guy named Artem. He's a well-decorated amateur. He's Armenian. He fought in Germany. He's got upset wins over, I believe, Samuel Molina. He beat uh, Humberto Galindo, I believe, who Muratala, off the top of my memory, Muratala stopped him, Danger Muratala, but he also dropped Muratala. He's a lot better than people are going to give him credit for, but it's also a testament to Frank Martin, where I think after his dominance against Michelle Riviera, a fighter who many of us believed was a top 10 lightweight, he relegated him into the top 11 to 25 with how thoroughly he performed in that fight. So now an unknown fighter who has never fought in the United States coming to face Frank Martin. Yes, this is the classic high risk, low reward fight, but also Martin has looked so good. We are putting him on the Mount Everest of fighters in this tier where unless you're a famous, well-known fighter, we're not going to favor anyone against you. I think it's also interesting that fighters like Devin Haney have taken shots at Frank Martin, which tell me that something about him makes him worthy to take shots at. You know, often people don't just yell at the wind. They yell at something of substance. Frank Martin is looking like an emerging player in this division, and he could be a dark horse who becomes a solid world champion who's able to defend the titles on many different occasions. Doesn't have a loss, but he reminds me a lot of other Texas fighters, Oshaki Foster and another undefeated welterweight who fights on this card, Quentin Randall, in the sense that he's kind of getting it how he's going to get it based off his own talent, pedigree, and belief in himself. 
Co-main event will be Nonito Donaire versus Alexandro Santiago. Santiago is one of these sneaky, tough guys, unheralded to the average fighter, but Paco Damien, promoter from where I live, sneaky at his ability to find these great, fantastic fighters, especially Mexican fighters. And Santiago had a close fight with Gary Antonio Russell. It didn't go his way. I believe he had a draw with Jerwin and Canajas, which many people thought probably should have gone his way in the Oakland, in an Oakland arena. I think it was Oracle at the time, but now it's just a parking lot because the Warriors no longer play there. He picked up a big win over Antonio Nueves, but what stands out about Santiago is big motor guy. Going to step on the gas and going to work the whole fight. Nonito Donaire is looking to break his own record. When he beat Nordin Oyulabi, probably said that atrociously, he became the oldest bantamweight champion that set up his undisputed or unification. It was unification because in a way had to fight Paul Butler to become the undisputed, but that fight really felt like an undisputed fight. It was Donaire versus Monster in a way. It was a rematch of their classic fight from 2019, and then Inouye did what he did, which is he knocked out Donaire, which kind of felt like all great fighters have one last hurrah, and in the second fight, Donaire kind of time caught up to him. Now he's 40 years old. He's fighting a very good, well-accomplished fighter, but also a fighter who, in his prime, probably couldn't beat a prime Nonito Donaire. So Donaire is looking to chase history. He's looking to win the vacant WBC bantamweight title at 40 years old. And it's an interesting storyline because I think that Nonito Donaire is my man Boogie Down. Uh, Boog Williams said once, Nonito Donaire is a national treasure, and I fully agree. Hidden hidden legend in plain sight. Forgotten legend. And we're, gonna, we're tuning in to see the greatness of Nonito Donaire. No disrespect to Santiago. Fine fighter. But I think the storyline here is, can Donaire beat his own record? And if he can't, we're going to send him off in a positive way as well. Opening the telecast, Elvis Rodriguez will take on Victor Postal. These guys have a bit of sparring history at the Wild Card Boxing Gym, from what I've heard. They've sparred each other. It's kind of the classic, really interesting fight on paper. Really hard fight to pick. But due to the place both fighters are in their career, it's not the most interesting fight. And those that's unfortunate to say, It's just flat out the truth. So Elvis Rodriguez lost to Kenny Sims Jr. Since he's gotten three wins, his last one against Joseph Adorno, kind of sketchy. It wasn't that performance that we wanted to see. It felt like he was just a bigger man. It felt very close. And then his size took over late in that fight. Adorno actually feels that he won the fight. And some people feel Adorno won that fight as well. Victor Postol, former world champion, stopped Lucas Matisse. And then he's had a slew of really close fights, never really getting the nod in those fights, but just being a troublesome, tough veteran contender who just can't quite get the big win. One of those fights that comes to mind is Jose Ramirez. Another one is Josh Taylor, just giving people very, very hard professional resistance at the highest level of the sport. His last fight, it was a weird stoppage against Gary Antoine Russell for Postal. Kind of curious how much Postal has left. He's had a lot of hard fights. That being said, Elvis Rodriguez is a lot greener in terms of his development and in terms of what he does inside of the ring than I think a lot of us really say. So that's going to be opening it up. I also want people to know Quentin Randall, good friend of mine, good friend of the program, is taking on Willie Jones. Quentin Randall has a fantastic story. It's actually a very sad, classic boxing story of constantly being tested his will being broken possibly at times but not his faith keeping him strong in the sport of boxing and boxing being his compass when things get as dark as possible quentin's a really good guy and if there's an ability to watch his fight please go out of your way to watch it now over on the zone on saturday night we're gonna have alicia Baumgartner. she's gonna have a homecoming very interesting subplot to this detroit now has had two women's boxing bouts in back-to-back months, essentially. Start to June and then July 15th. Bumgardner's taking on the woman who I, Christina, can't pronounce her last name. She beat Bumgardner. She was going to fight Michaela Mayer in April. Something came up. That can't happen. Bumgardner's team jumped on the opportunity to face her. This is kind of the get-back gang. This is her first 
uh, undisputed world title defense. She picked up the undisputed title in, I believe it was February, against Aline, can't say the last name. And it's going to be curious. Bumgardner is an A-list celebrity in the sport of boxing. She's a fantastic fighter. It's going to be curious to see if she levels up with the fame or if there's a level of contentment with fame. That is the big question. I haven't done any tape study on this, so this could be actually a very evenly contested fight. I'm hoping to see some of the rivalry that uh, Bumgardner had with Michaela Mayer because I feel like when she doesn't have this tension with an opponent, it's, um, it's not as interesting of a fight week as I expected in a more professional setting, as sad as that sounds. So I'm hoping to see some animosity. I just want to see Bumgardner kind of pass the tests of a proven star where now we know that she's a great fighter. We know that she has greatness. Does she let her foot off the gas in a hometown fight? Or does she try to go to the next level and become an iconic symbol of women's boxing? This sport is going to tell us a lot about Alicia Bumgardner, who really could be one of the generational talents in women's boxing and could be remembered far greater than I think a lot of us right now know. So I'm excited to see that. That's going to be an exciting fight. It seems as though two undercard bouts had fallen out. At the time of recording this video, Richardson Hitchens hadn't had an official opponent. I'm not sure if he's still on, but Montana Love withdrew from that fight with an injury. Just unsure if they're ever going to fight again to be quite honest with you it feels like Hitchens is kind of flirting with some of the top names in this division he's once again that high risk low reward guy really technical in his style not the biggest puncher but just cerebral and methodical fighting good opposition in matchroom with Eddie Hearn has really taken a liking to him Montana Love it just seems like he signed with matchroom and just things haven't gone his way We got to see what's next for him, but it it kind of feels like his loss to Stevie Spark might have been his kind of the height of his matchroom uh, career. Suleiman Sissiko is not listed on BoxRec, and I'm having a hunch that he might not be on this undercard as well. So if you're a fan of Suleiman, not sure we're going to see him on this card, but there is an interesting one. Andy Cruz, the Cuban Olympian gold medalist, Eddie Hearn has very high hopes for him. He's trained with Jerron Boots Innes, Bozy Innes, uh, his father. The hopes are high. He's turning pro against Juan Carlos Burgos, although on box rec, there's a big red flag next to Burgos' name, which always gives me the heebie-jeebies because that means something can change after I record this video, and that's never a good feeling. But Andy Cruz is kind of like an amateur's amateur, and I mean that in the best way. He was the best amateur of his era, Built up this crazy record, beat Keyshawn Davis twice. He was a lot of people's kryptonite. And now we have to see the age old thing is can he transition to the pros? Because some of his habits, including his check left hook, he stands really tall. He thinks he's being steezy and he's actually kind of vulnerable at times. So I'm curious to see. They're throwing him in 10 round fight against Juan Carlos Burgos, a very good fighter. I believe this is also a, a, um, a, a deliberate choice because I believe in December half-baked research Keyshawn Davis had fought this opponent so this is the classic okay he fought him now we're gonna fight him type opponent because there is natural animosity between Andy Cruz and Keyshawn Davis it's exciting because Andy Cruz has been one of these mythical fighters kind of like Guillermo Rigondeaux and Yuri Yorkis Gamboa where we've been hearing so much about him and now we're gonna see his debut and people will either be enamored with his style or just go, oh man, he's so overrated. So we, we're going to get the overreaction during this fight week. Also, Mark Castro will be featured on this card, a very good prize fighter and someone that's going to break out in the next few years, I think, as a very exciting action fighter in the sport of boxing. Kind of under the radar, we got Pro Box TV. William Foster III, very, very good 130-pound fighter. He's going to be in action. He's someone to watch for because I think he also has the chance of being a world champion. Defeated three undefeated fighters so far in his career. No small feat because he doesn't have like a ton of fights. So that's pretty impressive, one of which being Edwin De Los Santos, who we saw in action this past week. 
Josh Kelly's back in action. He's fighting on Wasserman Boxing, which I'm not very familiar with. But I believe Wasserman in America is a big sports agency. I don't know how that is combined. But Kelly's fighting at 154 pounds, and he's just basically looking to land a really big fight in the near future. So more credit to him, more power to him. But I don't think this is going to be one that if you're not a hardcore, hardcore fight fan or you don't live in this time zone and it happens to be on, I'm not sure you're going to go out of your way for it, but you can kind of tune into my sub stack or maybe tune into our podcast whenever it is. I'm not sure it's going to be Sunday this weekend because I'm on the road. And then you can get an update on kind of how that fight went and an assessment where he stands at the world level. Golden Boy is putting on a show, kind of a regional Mexico card with Alan Picasso. I can't lie to you. Outside of the press release I got, I don't know much about it. The positive is it might be on YouTube. Some of these shows that are DAZN Boxing, Golden Boy shows, also stream on YouTube. And if you're cheap or if you don't have DAZN, this is probably a more accessible show. And you might run into a fighter that you find very pleasing. And it's a fun way to kind of organically fight, find fighters that you're big fans of or just watch some boxing that we used to see kind of this is more of like a box as Tekka type card that we used to see in the early 2010s that I feel like we've kind of gotten away from in the streaming platform services. Also, the last housekeeping, some local fighters, including Willie Shaw and Joe Sean James will be fighting at a local show in Santa Rosa. I wish I could be there, but as I said before, I'm going to be having a surgery, and I don't think it's the best thing to do is have surgery and then get in my car the very next day and go to a fight card. So though I support my guys, I I absolutely love them to death, I sadly will not be at this card. I think Joe Sean James is a very talented middleweight that if a promoter or a manager got behind, he could be very, very profitable. Yet, I don't know how far he can go because that's up to Joe Sean. Sadly, Mikey Russell won't be on this card. Mike Russell was in camp with David Benavidez. He's absolutely outstanding in terms of his skill set and his ability. Mike Russell is someone that I think if he chooses to pursue boxing in the future, he could be really good. Jonathan Rubio trains with his dad, Brian Russell, um, another really, really good fighter at Southpaw. Very, very interesting style a style you don't always see on the kind of fringe club show level. And Willie Shaw, I've seen him since he was in the amateurs, and he's just a fantastic fighter. He's one of those special fighters that he learned his whole career as a pro. So I think he had like maybe five or six, 10, 12 amateur fights, and he's just jumped in. So his record might not be the sexiest, but he's the kind of guy that I respect the most. He's learning as a pro fighter. And he's taking fights. He's not turning down fights. He's accepting fights. He's willing to go and make these things happen. And I think that if you're a fight fan in the area, these are enjoyable fights. It just comes down to, would you like to go to Santa Rosa? Would you like to travel, see the card, this, that, and a third? I personally would if I wasn't going to probably be in bed all day. But I'm probably going to more than likely purchase this to support the promotion and to support the fighter read my newsletter to get information on there. Anyways, I appreciate each and every one of you. If you like it, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel. These videos come out weekly. I hope you enjoy it. Take care.